Good afternoon, everyone. I apologize that I, I can't speak in your native language, but after all, this whole session is about thinking, right? So you just have to think a little bit harder, uh, and I hope it will be worth your while. Uh, I've been thinking a lot as well. So just by background, as you've heard just a few words, um, I'm a math guy. I'm a numbers guy. I like to build models. I like to predict things. Uh, and as a professor at Wharton now for 25 years, that's what I've been doing. But I've noticed a big disconnect between the things that we're predicting, who will buy what, how often, under what circumstances, what a company can do in order to get them to buy more, or to get the right customers to buy more. I'm noticing a disconnect between that and what companies are actually doing. We hear a lot of companies talking about uh, these words over here, customer centricity, but I'm concerned in a couple of ways. Number one, different companies, different managers, different experts mean different things. They define it differently. We want to be customer centric. What does it mean? And in some cases, the actions, the words that, that some companies are using, claiming that it's customer centric, are completely opposite to the reality that, that I see when I look at the data and I, and I understand what consumer behavior is and what it might be. So what I want to do here is I want to bring some clarity to this term customer centricity. I want to make it real clear what it is. Uh, and what I really want you to, to do, the real takeaway from this session, is I want you to think about whether, how, and when your, your company should really, really try to be customer centric. I am not claiming that every one of you needs to be. In fact, I recognize that for many of the companies in this room, it wouldn't make sense to do it now. It might not make sense to do it even three years from now. But give us five or 10 years from now, there's a pretty good chance that many of your firms will want to do real customer centricity. And if that's true, then you need to start thinking about it today. So where I want to start is business as usual. Before we can appreciate a different way of doing business, we need to be on the same level about just the way that most companies here and around the world do business. So please allow me two slides just to review with you the basic principles of just you know, business 101, okay? So, so what's the, the overall, the overarching objective for any commercial enterprise? I mean, you can answer that question, but I, I know you'd answer it the right way. To make as much money as possible, right? And not just to make as much money as possible today, but tomorrow and the year after. And if we add up all of that money that you make, all those profits, recognizing that the dollars that we earn today are worth more to us than the dollars that we earn a year from now, if we, if we discount the future cash flows, then in theory, if we take all those profits and add them up, we'd get the overall value of the firm. Right, so it's our job, it's your job to maximize shareholder value. We agree on that? Now there's a traditional way of achieving that goal that I bet that most of your companies are still using today, and that's fine. I am not saying it's wrong. Okay, I just want to review it, make sure we agree. Uh, and it's a, it's a way of doing business that goes back over 100 years. I think we can maybe give credit to, to Henry Ford. He invented the production line, he, he revolutionized business, and the whole idea was, let's produce stuff at a really high level. And that's great. If we can produce a lot and sell a lot, we make more money. But there's this other benefit. The more we produce, the more efficiently we produce it, our costs come down. And that's a wonderful, magical formula to guaranteed success. The more we produce, the more revenue we make, our costs come down, you can't lose. That's the way companies have done business, both on the product and service side, for a long time. It's the way that most companies still operate today. You agree? And there's all kinds of metrics, all kinds of measures that we use to gauge how well a company is doing that and to predict how well a company will be doing that in the future. So there's lots of metrics, and one of them that I'm sure uh, many of you, you, all of you are familiar with, many of you obsess over, would be market share. And, and there have been a lot of studies that show, indeed, that market share is not only a good reflection of how well you've been doing, turning the crank and pushing the volume out and getting the cost down, but it also predicts how well you will continue to do it. 
But none of you or your shareholders are satisfied with doing this stuff as well as possible. Your shareholders want more. They want, they want growth, right? It's not enough just to run a particular business really efficiently. You want more. And so where does growth come from in a traditional kind of business? It comes from taking that product or service and extending it. And I mean that in two different ways. So internally, you have a certain kind of expertise to be able to, to, to design, to produce, to deliver, to communicate about a certain kind of product or service. And you do it better than anyone else in your industry. And so you can go to the R&D folks in your company and say, give us some more of that. Give us a new product, something radically different or something that's just a slight twist on products that, you've, that you've already have. So we're going to take our product expertise and extend it into new products or services. That's one way. And the other way is to take the products that we offer and extend them to new customers. So to go to new geographic areas, go to new segments, find new uses for those existing products. So that's where growth comes from. Again, whether it's internal R&D or external spreading this great product elsewhere, it's all about product growth. I think it's fair to say that if I were to, to look at the organizational chart for every one of your companies, I'd see a very product-centric organizational structure. And why all this has worked for so many years is that product expertise has truly been a competitive advantage for a long time. Again, we're uniquely good at producing a certain kind of product or service. Even though there's some, some tough competitors out there, they're always a step behind. Okay, we're always inventing one step ahead of them. That's the way business has worked for a long time. I have a chart over here that's hard to, hard to uh, fully see. Uh, I'm going to talk more about it later on, but I want to call attention to just one point on it over here. The overall mental process associated with the product-centric approach is what we call divergent thinking. How many possible uses are there of this product? Again, you have a particular product or service, what can we do with it? Where can we spread it? How can we change it to come up with other products and services? That kind of divergent thinking is, is we, we look for it and we reward it in most enterprises today. Okay? That's where we are. That's where we've been. If anyone wants to argue with me, I'm, I'm glad to do so. But I, I think I'm just telling you what you already know. So let's change things a little bit. Let's recognize that, as Mayor said, I, I, my Hebrew is really bad, but I saw him do this. And he spoke about the acceleration of everything. <clears throat> Implicit in that message is the idea that the traditional product-centric approach, I'm not saying it's going away, but I am suggesting that some of the shine has come off it. Some of the guaranteed success of turning that crank and selling a lot of stuff at a low cost it's just not quite as good now as it was 15 or 20 years ago. And I have a whole bunch of reasons why over here, and I want to call attention to the title of this slide. Again, I am not saying that if you, if you follow the product-centric approach, you're doomed. No, I'm not saying that at all, okay? But I am saying that it's just not quite as good as it was before, because the same technology underlying the acceleration of everything is taking some of the goodness away from us. And we could have a great discussion about it, but it's in the interest of time. Let me just run through seven points with you real quick. Again, they're going to be pretty obvious, but I think you'll agree with me that it's just making life a little bit tougher today than it was 20 years ago. So, so we're really good at producing something, but unfortunately, our competitors are getting really good too. Okay? The, so one aspect of the acceleration of everything is that product life cycles are shortening. And we know that as soon as we come up with a new idea, boom, our competitors are going to have it. There's going to be a much shorter window for us to enjoy that innovation compared to how it used to be. If we think about our customers, they're a lot smarter than they were before. And it's not necessarily because their brains are composed differently, but it's because of, again, all that technology, all that social media. It used to be the case that we would put a particular product or service out there and we controlled the message. We controlled the timing. Here you go, customer. Here's something for you. If you're good, if you're willing to pay us what we ask, you can have it. It's up to you to figure out how to make it work with everything else in your life, but you don't have a choice. Today, 
Customers do have choices, and it's not only because of the commoditization, it's because they're aware of the choices in a way that they wouldn't have been aware of them uh, previously. Technology does one more thing for us. It makes every product available everywhere. So it used to be that we could count on the fact of having a natural monopoly, that maybe we're not the best in the world at producing this particular product, but our customers couldn't possibly get access to stuff from some faraway country. Today, everything is everywhere. So between globalization and deregulation, and another really important point, the change in our customers. Think about our children today. Yeah, I have a 19-year-old and a 16-year-old. How do we describe today's children, today's teenagers, compared to us when we were teenagers? Maybe they're smarter, maybe they multitask, but there's a couple of words, and you'll agree with me, all of you with teenage kids, they're spoiled, right? They want exactly the product they want, in the form they want it, at the time they want it, through the distribution channel that they want, they're controlling the whole thing. And a lot of companies are lamenting this fact. They're saying, boy, oh boy, we can't wait till these teenagers grow up and grow out of that because, you know, it's just tough dealing with them. Well, you know what? That's not going to happen. Our spoiled teenagers are going to be tomorrow's spoiled customers. I mean, already many of them are today's spoiled customers. Okay? They're not interested in just taking the particular products and services that you sell and that you sell and figuring out how to combine it together. They don't want products. They want solutions, right? You can't just be a product firm anymore. You have to be a solution provider. And sometimes that means that you have to build in products and services that maybe you don't even sell, that you're not making any money on it. But if you want to maintain the relationship with this customer, you have to do it. Okay? And there's lots of examples of companies that have come to this realization in either a good way or a bad way. A wonderful example would be IBM. Okay? Now, you might know that IBM used to stand for international business machines. Well, they don't sell business machines anymore. What are they? They're a solution provider, is what they like to say. They're a consulting firm now. They had this great realization in the 1990s that, you know what? We have a customer over here. She's actually going to be a better customer. She's going to stay with us longer and buy more stuff from us. Now, that person was probably fired for doing that, but it was a real revelation that if we're really interested in this long-term relation with the customer, sometimes we need to sell them products and services where we make no money on it. And IBM realized that, and slowly but surely they spun off all of their products because there's a lot more money for them to make selling solutions, teaching customers how to stick things together. There's bigger margins in that than commoditized products. And I have one other point for you over here, and it's a different kind of point. First of all, it reflects my own bias. I'm a data guy. It's all about the data. The data that we have today is very different than the data that we had before. Henry Ford had no idea who was buying which car, and he didn't care. If he pushed 10 million cars out the door in a particular year, he didn't care if it was one customer buying 10 million or 10 million buying one unit. He didn't care, okay, because there's no way he'd ever know. But today we can know. And my point over here is that this lets us start to think about a different way of doing business that would have been unthinkable before. Okay? Maybe instead of figuring out how we can take all of this data and jam it into our current business model, that's what most of you are thinking about. Right? How, do we, how do we take all that data and make best use of it? Now, I want to be clear. There's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that at all. If you're running a product-centric business, you might as well use the data as effectively as possible to help you figure out how to turn that crank and keep the volumes up and the costs down. So these other points, these other six points, are reasons why the product centricity isn't quite as good as it was before. This point says nothing bad about product centricity, but it does open up a window to a different way of doing business, to a different mindset, to a different strategy. In fact, the words product-centric didn't even exist until recently. There was business. Business meant producing things at high volumes, low cost, and all that. But now, all of a sudden, it's almost like when a fish jumps out of water for the first time and looks around and says, I'm not in the water anymore. That's the first time the fish realizes the environment that it's been operating in all that time. Some of you have been jumping out of the water and realizing, you know what? There can be a different environment as well. And that's where customer centricity comes in. 
So what I want to do is I want to define customer centricity for you, and I will in two slides. It'll be a boring definition. So I want to work our way there. So like I said before, I want, to, I want you to realize that there's a lot of different definitions to it. Some of them are wrong. So I want to do just a little quiz real quick. I know we have a number of retailers here, uh, and I think retail is a nice example. Now, granted, these are US retailers, but I'm sure that you're familiar with most, if not all of them. I'm just going to show you a list of the retailers, and I want you to tell me which ones of these retailers do you think is truly customer-centric? All right, so here's the list. I'm going to give you four retailers. I'm sure that all of you are familiar with Walmart. Certainly everyone knows Apple, Starbucks. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Nordstrom, high-end uh, department store uh, in the US. I don't know if you, if you know them or not, but just think about it, some other you know, very high-end, service-oriented department store. So which of these companies Okay, you can vote for all, you can vote for none, would you say are customer-centric? Okay, so let's, let's go down the list real quick, because I'm very curious to see what you'll say. So how many of you would say that Walmart is a customer-centric company? If you believe that Walmart is customer-centric, raise your hand. I'm getting one vote for Walmart. <laughs> Two votes for Walmart. Uh, so again, for those of you who know Nordstrom's, or think about it, again, another real high-end, service-oriented department store, Nordstrom's. I know, again, the one reason why, usually when I do my little quiz, Nordstrom's is top of the list. And there's a particular reason why, which we'll talk about in a moment. Apple? Bunch of apples. You can never walk into a room and, and ask a positive attribute of Apple. Every hand has to go up automatically. You don't, you don't even think about that. You just do it. Okay? Uh, and Starbucks. Lots of hands for Starbucks. I would contend that none of these firms are customer-centric. Now, I'm not knocking them. They're good firms. Okay? I think many of us aspire to be as, as good as these firms. But there's different reasons why they're not customer-centric, and that's why I want to go over the list with you real quick. First of all, Walmart. What does Walmart know about its, its typical customer? The answer is a whole lot. For instance, in the U.S., Walmart knows that when a hurricane is about to come and hit the East Coast, that they need to fill the stores. They need to stock a lot of... Water, batteries. Well, their, their research has shown they need a lot of Pop-Tarts. I don't know if you know that, but it's a US breakfast pastry. It wouldn't be obvious that that's what you need when you're having a hurricane about to come. So on one hand, they know a lot about their customers, but what does Walmart know about me? Or you? Nothing. Walmart makes no effort to track individual level customers and understand how they're different from each other and target some differently than others. Why? Because what is Walmart's business model? Let's sell at really high volume, and let's do so at really low cost. They're a very product-centric company, and that's fine. They're doing well. I don't know how many of you know about Nordstrom. How many of you do are familiar with the Nordstrom department store in the US? There's a very famous story about Nordstrom's. Anyone know the very, very famous story about Nordstrom's? Don't know if it's true or not, but here's the story. A person walked into a Nordstrom department store in Fairbanks, Alaska, with an old used set of tires and said, I want my money back. Nordstrom gave this person their money back. Nordstrom has never, ever sold tires. You read all about it, and people will say, this shows what an amazingly customer-centric company they are. And I would say, this shows what a stupid company they are. Okay. Now, there might be a reason why, or forget about Nordstrom's, there might be a reason why you would give a customer their money back for a product they never bought from you. Why would you do that? What would be the circumstance that would encourage you to do that? What's that? Well, it's great PR. Okay, that's true in this case. But on a day-to-day -day basis, you're not doing it for the PR. On a day-to-day -day basis, you might have a customer who's so incredibly valuable that if you don't give them money back for the product they never bought from you, they're going to take all their business and leave. Okay, all right, we'll give you money back for your tires. That's probably not true here, because you wouldn't bring tires into the store if you were an existing customer, because you'd know they don't sell it. Okay, so I love Nordstrom's. I buy a lot of clothing there. But when I walk into the Nordstrom's, you know what the problem is? They treat me really well. I don't mind that but they treat everybody really well. And that's the problem. 
They need to know who are the customers who deserve the really, really great treatment and who are the ones who, well, I'm not saying to treat them badly. Never, never, never do that. But don't necessarily deserve quite as good treatment as the really good ones. That's the key. And it's difficult. And it's risky. And it requires the use of data to be able to understand and predict both the upside that a customer offers and the downside of maybe treating them badly. You couldn't do that 15 years ago. You couldn't do it 100 years ago, which is why a company like Nordstrom's and many others wants to treat everybody really well. But today you can. Because of the data and because of technology, you can send different messages to different people. And then there's, uh, there's Apple. Apple makes fine products. What does Apple know about you? When was the last time that you got a message from Apple that was customized to your tastes and your behaviors? Or what did Steve Jobs care about you? What did Steve Jobs care about his customers? How often did he ask his customers what they wanted? Never, right? He was proud of that fact of saying, I'll tell them what they want. And you know what? He was right. <laughs> or maybe he was lucky. I'm not sure. Okay? But Apple has made no effort to figure out who the really good customers are and wrap themselves around it. Apple, once again, like Walmart, but in a different way, is a terrific product-centric company. They're amazing at design and development and communication and delivery. Okay? They're great at pushing things out the door and having people line up around the block to buy those things and letting people figure out how to get those things to fit into their life on their own. They're not a solution provider. Okay? They're a producer of very nice, shiny objects. Okay? Maybe better than anyone else. They don't need to be customer-centric. At least, not yet. And then there's Starbucks. Starbucks drives me crazy. I can understand these other firms, but Starbucks... I would like to be able to walk into a Starbucks here in Tel Aviv, if there are any, I, don't, I haven't seen any, uh, and, and uh, show my loyalty card and say, I'd like the usual, please. Okay, let's say I do it in a different city where there are Starbucks. What would they do? They'd look at you and say, who are you? <laughs> What's your regular? Okay, I can't help you. They need to be able to do that. And there are companies that do that. So I'm sure many of you, all of you are familiar with the Ritz-Carlton hotel chain. There's a great example. When you pull up to the, the, the valet to take your car and they ask you your name, by the time you walk to the front desk, they have your key waiting for you. They know everything about you. Oh, it's good to see you again. We have the room that you like with the pillows that you always request. Oh, by the way, they have the, the steak that you like in the restaurant. Okay? They know all of that because they track and they anticipate and they react really quickly. Starbucks could do that as well. Starbucks could have a, a setting where you, you, know, you swipe your loyalty card and you press the regular please button. Now, I'm not saying everyone would use that. There's a lot of people who go into a coffee shop like that. They want the experience. They want to talk to someone. They like saying, I want my vente mochaccino with those whatever, whatever. That's fine. Nothing's stopping you from doing that. But there's a lot of people, especially in a country like this, where you're in a hurry, okay? And you'd rather just say the regular please, and you'd like to be able to do that in every store. Starbucks, I think, is missing a great opportunity in that way by understanding that there are some customers who really deserve that kind of special treatment. So those are bad examples of customer centricity. Fine firms, very good in certain ways, but missing a little bit. Finally, Here's my definition of customer centricity. I want you to spend a, a couple of minutes looking at it. Okay? I, after everything you've heard me say, and perhaps from your own experiences, I hope you'll agree with me that this is a reasonable definition of customer centricity. But if you think about these words very, very seriously, just imagine if you went in tomorrow, okay, or if people who worked for you went in tomorrow and started doing this, they'd be fired. There's a lot of things up here that, while they sound good, don't fit well in the way a company does business. Let me just point out a couple of them and then talk about the implications of what this definition really means. Number one, select set of customers. You can see on the fourth line over there. To admit that there are some customers who are better than others. To admit that we're going to treat them differently. That's a tough thing to do. Again, in the old days, we couldn't do it because we couldn't tell the customers apart. Actually, in the old, old days, 
You know, if we go into the, to the old city of Jerusalem and you want to um, uh, buy something, you know that you're going to be charged a different price than the person before you and the person after you. They're going to size you up and figure out what you're worth and then charge you the appropriate price. That's the way to do business. We lost that skill over the last hundred years when we made everything the same. Now, I'm not saying we want to go all the way back to the old, old days, but we want to use technology to be able to do that in a much more scalable and effective manner. So we really do want to treat people differently, not necessarily on pricing alone, that can get risky, but on service and on selection and on convenience. All right, so that's one reason why a lot of people would be fired because again, in the Henry Ford days, you can never have select customers. We need all of the customers to get our volumes as high as possible. I contend that if you have a select set of customers and you could find the right ones and make them really value, valuable and extract that value from them, you can potentially make more money than just trying to treat many, many people the same way. Not necessarily, but there's a chance that you can. Number two, the bottom line over here. Maximize long-term financial value. Doesn't that make sense? Who's going to argue with that? Except, back to my IBM story, okay, if you find someone in your company who says, you know what, buy this other company's product instead. It's a better fit with your needs. Are you going to encourage that kind of behavior? Well, if you're truly customer-centric, you should. But if it's business as usual, that person's fired, right? The other part about it is, Everyone turns to their shareholders and says, we are out there to try to maximize long-term value of our firm. And then they turn around to the employees and say, okay, folks, we have quarterly numbers to meet. Let's go. One of the nice things about customer centricity, if it's appropriate for your company, is that it truly aligns long-term interests. So we're going to invest in our customers for the long term, and that's going to be good for the company in the long term. So if you really believe in this long-term stuff, then customer centricity is the right way to go. This definition has all kinds of implications for how you run a business. It changes the way you incentivize your employees. It changes the way you manage your sales force. It changes the way you go to R&D. Instead of going to the R&D people and say, all right, R&D people, what's the next blockbuster you have for me? You don't do it that way anymore. Now you go to the R&D people and you say, R&D people, here are our focal customers over here. These are the really valuable ones. Come up with something for them. Come up with something that's going to make them even more valuable. And oh, by the way, other people will buy it too. But let's focus on their needs more than the needs of others. A very different mentality than just finding a, a, a lowest you know, product that fits everybody's needs. So many, many implications for how you run a company over here. Let me talk now about, uh, to kind of summarize what all this customer centricity stuff means. So if you're living in a customer centric world, first of all, unlike, in, in, in contrast to a product centric world, what's your single overarching objective? Well, that was a trick question. Maximize shareholder value. There's a lot of people, a lot of companies who say, listen, I'm in this business to make money, okay? I don't want to do that customer centric stuff, that's silly. They equate it to communism, okay? I believe that customer centricity is just as much about making money as product centricity. I'm a Wharton professor. That's what it's all about, right? It's just a completely different path that gets you there. And the first step on that path, the first realization, the big, big difference between product centricity, where we're focusing on that product, producing a whole lot of it, as much as possible, and customer centricity, it goes back to the stories that I've been telling you. It's, it's a recognition, not just a recognition, a celebration that customers are different from each other. Like, yay, we know who the good customers are and who the not so good customers are. Yay, we know which ones we should really be focusing on and, and, and to guide our product development decisions. Companies that aren't in a position to celebrate customer heterogeneity aren't in a position to really be customer-centric. And some really important points over here. If you were to go to your customers and find out, do, do the math or whatever, and find out what each and every customer is worth. Okay, this is really important. What is each customer worth? And then look at a, 
a, a, a distribution of, of how many of them are really valuable and how many of them are not so valuable, what would that distribution look like? Okay, for most people, when I say, what, what does a distribution look like? They draw me this picture over here. Because in some horrible statistics course that you took years ago, they say everything looks like this. Here's our really valuable customers, here's our not so valuable ones, and then there's eh, all those average ones in the middle. That would be nice, but it's not true. Okay, that's just the myth. The reality of it is that it always looks like this. Okay? It always looks like this. And this goes back to our main points. There are a few customers out there who are incredibly valuable, will do pretty much anything for them, and then there's everybody else, eh. If you want to buy our products, we're very glad, but don't expect the same kind of treatment. So because this is the way it works in every industry, this is an example from, uh, from telecommunications, but I see it in financial services, packaged goods, retailing, nonprofits, all across the board. Okay, so it's really important to recognize this because that drives a lot of the decisions that we make. And when I talk about customer profitability, I want to be even more specific about that. I am not talking about how much money we have made from these customers so far. I'm talking about how much money we are likely to make from them in the future. Past profits are nice, but we already have that. We've already accounted for that. The way we're going to decide who's valuable and who's not so valuable is what are they going, what are they going to be worth to us? And again, that's going to require a bit more math, a bit more analysis. It's a bit harder. It's a challenge. It might be reason enough to not do it. But if you can do it, and you can figure out who are the valuable ones, there's big money to be made. Now, I've said that several times. I've, I've said, I keep saying if, so I'm not saying it's necessarily true for everybody. But I've said it several times now. There's more money to be made in some circumstances if you know who those valuable customers are. Where's that extra money going to come from? How are you going to have a potentially more profitable company by being customer-centric than by being product-centric? The answer to that question is right over here. These are words that you all know. Customer acquisition, customer retention, customer development. These are tactics that you all use all the time. So they're not new. My point over here is that if you want to be customer-centric, it's a matter of taking these kinds of tactics and raising them to a much higher level in the organization. It's not enough anymore just to build a nice brand. It's not enough anymore to have a, a catchy slogan or to have a good celebrity who's speaking on your behalf. Yeah, you want to do that stuff too. I'm not saying branding goes away. But these kinds of customer-oriented tactics move up to the same level. You need to have you know, a chief customer officer at the same level as the person who's coming up with the ad campaigns. To take these rather low tasks and say, this is the key. Figuring out who those really valuable customers will be and where do they live? What do they read? What other products do they buy? Being much more effective about customer acquisition. Customer attention makes me crazy. Okay, certainly in the US, uh, I can call up my, my cell phone provider and say, I'm going to leave. And they'll say, don't leave, don't leave, don't leave. Here's a lot of money. Please stay with us. And they'll do that for pretty much everybody. It's knowing who to do it for and who to say, see ya. It's been fun. Treating different customers differently. So I think companies today are overusing retention tactics because they're so afraid of losing existing customers. I don't want to lose customers. But I contend that some of them are going to leave anyway, no matter what we do. And if we're smart about our customer acquisition, we could probably find ones who are just as good as them anyway. And then finally, there's customer development. Taking our existing customers and making them more valuable. Cross-selling, upselling, getting them to buy our products more often. And on some occasions, charging them a little more. I have to whisper, because I can get in big trouble for saying that. But sometimes it makes sense. If customers see great value in our relationship, they're willing to pay for it. So it doesn't mean an across-the-board price increase. It means using the data very carefully and trying to figure out who are the customers who are finding great value, aren't that price sensitive. Okay, so I want to be careful about it, but it's a tactic that needs to be considered, just like it is in the old city. 
Very different kind of organizational structure, organizing by customer segments instead of by products. And this point over here, it looks like the same point I raised earlier. It looks like I just changed relationship for product. I mean something very different here. See, the problem with the product expertise, as we said before, acceleration of everything, you, you, you're, the, the margin that you have, your product expertise, is much smaller than it used to be because of technology. The beautiful thing about relationship expertise, if you have the data and you use it and you draw meaningful insight about who's likely to do what and you figure out which message to serve them through which channel at which time, no one can ever take that away from you. All the technology in the world can't take away that particular competitive advantage. So I see this idea of relationship expertise, and again, I'm not saying in just a, in a soft way, I mean in a hard data-driven way, is, is, a, is a true lasting competitive advantage. Now, is it worth betting the company and shifting in this direction? I'm not so sure, okay? But it's worth thinking about it. Uh, here's the slide I showed you before. We go look very quickly at the standard product-centric approach. And by the way, it's from a wonderful book that talks about if you've made the commitment, how do you get there? I just want to draw this one contrast uh, for you. So for product-centric uh, thinking, it's all about divergent. How do we take this product and do other things with it? But in the customer-centric world, it's all about convergent thinking. So here is the focal customer. How are we going to uh, make these customers more valuable? How are we going to extract the value from them? What other products and services should we develop or bring from outside to make these customers more valuable, to lock them in and to develop them further? It is a completely different mindset. If you're interested, I'll be glad to send you all the slides, and we'll certainly make them available. This one chart in particular is a very nice checklist, a very nice roadmap to see how well you're doing. I won't even talk about the other points there, the metrics and the organization and so on, but it's a really nice way to, to, to see how you're doing on the road towards customer centricity. I love to see examples like this. I look at a company like Procter & Gamble. Procter & Gamble, which knows almost nothing about its end consumers yet trying so hard to figure out who that right target segment would be, in this case, African-American women, and trying to surround them with a variety of products that they offer. And this is very unusual. You don't often see Procter & Gamble advertising multiple different products from multiple different categories at the same time. This is an example of customer centricity. And bringing in other kinds of services, recipes, concerts, and so on, that they have nothing to do with. They don't make a penny on it. This is an example of customer centricity. I think it will fail, okay? I give P&G a lot of credit for trying, but there's a million reasons why it probably won't work in the long run, okay? I'm not sure that the person who runs this initiative is at the right place in the organization, is given the right resources to do it. I'm not sure that they have enough data on their end consumers to be able to tell whether the program's working or not. So I'm not that optimistic about it, but still, I think it's a wonderful example. And you have to realize that going in this customer-centric direction does involve a lot of trial and error. You have to try something like this, hope it works, but even if it fails, you can start to understand some of the reasons why. Some of the barriers that, that kept you from being customer-centric in the first place. Uh, just an example over here about how we, we, we can tie together the lifetime value of the customers with the method that we acquired them. I just wanted to make a little, little plug for Google over here, uh, but, but just to show that using tools like those that Google offers is a great way to understand who are the really valuable customers and, and, and how can we acquire them differently than the ones who are not quite as valuable. I want to close with a bunch of questions over here, questions that we're not going to answer right now. But again, I'm trying to be honest with you. I'm trying to be objective. I'm trying to say that I want you to think about being customer-centric. And there's, there are barriers to overcome. They might be regulatory. They might be, uh, there might be limitations in the data that you can get. There might be issues like a Procter & Gamble, when, where you have many distributors and intermediaries between you and that end user. Lots of reasons, lots of barriers. But I, but I want you to start thinking about them and saying, are they insurmountable, in which case, never mind. I just wasted some of your time. But can you overcome those barriers? What resources can you find? A big step along the way is figuring out who is the customer. 
If you think about it in the pharmaceutical industry, who is the customer? Is it the patient? Is it the physician? Is it the hospital? Is it the insurance company? The answer is all of the above. So how can you come up with a clear answer? How can you pick one of those above the others and truly, truly focus on one of them while using the others as, yeah, okay, we have to do reasonably well on those. A lot of challenges there that you really need to agree to before you move ahead. So I want to leave it at that. And uh, if we have just a couple of minutes for questions, I'd be just delighted to address them. Oh, and by the way, I have to give you a plug for my little book over here. So if you're interested in reading more about this stuff, customer centricity, download it on Amazon. But um, I'm re real curious to get your thoughts and your questions about some of these kinds of issues. And I'm not going to leave till I get some questions. <laughs> yes, please. So some, some really great examples. I wish I had more time. Uh, one wonderful example would be the, the biggest grocery retailer in the UK, Tesco. A great company that used to be a real small, they were getting beaten up by much larger players, but they turned to the data. Uh, and, and not just, it wasn't just, hey, let's collect a lot of data. They drew meaningful insight from it. And, and there's a, a great book on that called Scoring Points that talks about how they turn themselves around. Um, Harris is a casino chain in the U.S. Same thing. Again, a company that was just getting crushed in its industry turned to the data, meaningful insight, great success. So, so there's a lo lots of nice examples. And of course, there's lots of e-commerce examples, too. In the U.S., we have our Amazon and so on. So there are lots of good examples. And, and I thank you for raising that. I don't want to only criticize. It's worth praising as well. Other questions? Other comments? Oh, yes, please. Uh -huh. Robin? Uh, how, would you oh. how would you characterize those firms that should be becoming customer-centric earlier rather than later? Mm -hmm. It's a good question. So if you think about what the, the ingredients that, that, that you have to have in place, so you have to have the ability to see and track individual customers, and you have to have the ability to customize your offerings, to be able to offer a different service or different product to different people. So some companies just don't have that. Now, some companies could have that. They've just chosen not to. So those are companies I'm not going to let off the hook. It's the companies that just can't have it for technology or regulatory reasons that I'm willing to let them wait. But other companies that do have that kind of direct contact with customers and the ability, if not the current infrastructure, to let you do that need to be thinking even more about these kinds of issues. And I want to make it clear that it's not just B to C. Okay? In fact, some of the best examples of this kind of activity is in the business-to-business -business world. In fact, business-to-business -business firms, often with a small set of customers, are really, really good at knowing who are the good customers, who are the not-so-good ones. Let's treat them differently. Let's give them different terms when we negotiate with them. Okay? That's, that's true relationship marketing. So in many ways, all I want to do is to take that, that small numbers business-to-business -business mindset and be able to scale it up on a much broader basis where you can't necessarily have that same kind of one-to-one -one relationship as you can in a B2B world. So it's an important point there. Do we have time for one more? Well, if not, I want to thank you very much for your attention. I hope that this is causing you to think a little bit differently about an issue that I know has been floating around, but I, I want you to make a more serious decision about whether, how, and when uh, to go after customer centricity. Thank you very much.